Um, again, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the second part of our after the second of this summit. My name is Dr. Leonard I'm from the School of Civil and Urban Engineering at the University of Technology, Sydney. I'm a senior lecturer at Berkeley, one of the chief investigators. So, um, before I begin, I would like to first acknowledge the value of people of the Indian Nation, a point of the as our city campus now stands, and also to uh, like to pay respect to the elders, both uh, past, present, and worthy. So, this afternoon, uh, the same way we do our first uh, session, uh, we have five speakers. So, for the five speakers, um, there will be about 10 to 15 minutes of presentation, and we will be having a few uh, questions and answer for them at the end. And if you still have time at the end, then after the fifth speaker, then we will have some discussion. And also we'll be uh, going to present some of the results of the survey that we sent out to the investigators uh, before this uh, summit. So to just to see the feedback so far and how we can improve our the management of this time and going, uh, going forward. After which, um, after this afternoon session, we will have some social networking drinks. Um, it will be probably at the foyer. So I would like to invite everyone to please stay and we will have some drinks uh, for one an hour uh, after this. Anyway, thank you very much for staying over. And uh, we can start now for the first speaker for this afternoon. So the first speaker is Professor Michael Du. Um, he is uh, one of the chief investigators. He's a chief investigator from Victoria University. Uh, with the Institute of Sustainable Industries and Livable Cities. Um, he has worked for 22 uh, years in materials and applications research for management technology for sustainable foods processing, resource recovery, and water energy saving applications. And Professor Duke is also the first uh, recipient of the inaugural Tony Flynn Award for his outstanding contributions to environment science and technology for the Membrane Society of Australasia. He is also a former panel member of the Australian Research Council College of Experts, the founding president of the Membrane Society of Australia, and currently co editor of the International Journal of Examination. And he is also currently the president of the World Association of Membrane Societies. That's a lot. Professor Michael. Yes, Oh, thanks, Leonard. And it's a great pleasure to be um, um, a CI on the hub and um, and uh, sort of joining in and being able to contribute and collaborate um, uh, together. And uh, congratulate uh, Sean, Leonard, Sharob, and um, Ibrahim and, and the great work that uh, you guys are doing to to bring us all together. And uh, and uh, good luck and look forward to working together. So, um, as you heard from Leonard, um, there's a lot of membrane in my bio, and I actually do have a slide about the wonderful. Um, Things about membranes. Um, so um, yeah, there's more to come. Anyway, so what I was going to talk about um, is uh, demonstrating um, innovative technologies, membrane technologies for industrial wastewater treatment and supporting circular economy. So what I've um, done is I've um, assembled a few projects that we've done in the past with some industry partners and very applied. Um, there's not much uh, science in those, but there's more in those with the paper. So if you want to talk to me about those, I'm going to just kind of touch on them briefly and talk a bit about um, the project in which we're going to embark on as part of the NICE Hub. Okay. So, um, yeah, we've heard a lot about the circular economy, but I wanted to make a particular point about um, resource recovery and circular economy. Uh, resource recovery supporting the circular economy um, that can progress when there's a value that's realized. So, um, in through our work with industry, in terms of um, there's it's, it's actually quite a common question, even before uh, things like resource recovery and circular economy were, were mentioned as part of the purpose, it was um, more about, um, you know, we've got this waste, we've got a problem, there's something of potential value in it. Um, can I make it, uh, you know, part of our business to get to something out of that waste? and deal with the problem um, at the same time. <clears throat> so if you look at some existing cases, um, particularly um, the dairy industry is a really great example of where it goes back uh, decades actually is to um, uh, where resource recovery and you could say circular economy is so the, now that it's actually part of their business to sort of think that um, um, at that time before it happened, you could say, you know, a circular economy approach, but basically dealing with the milk and the whey proteins after cheese making, um, they had a problem, they used to just dispose of it. Um, it was regulated just for them to stop doing that. 
And um, as a process of trying to deal with that, they now recover the whey proteins and now make a lot of money out of them. Um, this is the same for lactose, biogas, we're already doing it, biosolids, and even if you just take waste water that's got nitrogen irrigated with that, you're actually recovering the, the nutrients already. And they do that already today. So what can we really learn about those situations where you could actually say, you know, there was um, an opportunity, it was take, they took hold of it, and, you know, now it's actually um, it's actually utilised and dealt with the waste problem in a, in a, in a viable way. Um, but where we are today is that um, much more needs to be recovered. So we're still dealing with it. I've um, mentioned a couple of times that the, the issue is only just growing with us in terms of um, uh, waste generation and pollution and also the demand for um, high quality uh, um, products. But often in any kind of situation, why well, you can't do anything with your waste is because of the contaminants, but also the fact that it's really quite dilute. This is where membranes, as I mentioned, I promised I'll have a slide on membranes um, can come to, um, to support a circular economy. And the thing about membranes um, is that uh, you can pretty much separate most molecules from other molecules quite effectively, um, starting from macromolecules down all the way down to um, you know, ions, for example, in a partition, and particularly exciting type of separation I find is uh, nanofiltration. <laughs> Yeah, nanofiltration, just because you can, you know, separate sugars and minerals and touch partition and minerals um, um, size range and also with the charges. Um, and the good thing about membranes and some of the projects I'm going to present that uh, reason why there was an attraction to look at them versus other processes is that um, besides separating valid materials from complex solutions, um, they don't change the, the material that you're separating. Other, other um, things like reaction, like you can use oxidation and so forth, you're going to change that uh, compound. So you might actually render it useless or actually make it more toxic. So there's a challenge there. <clears throat> and also to another thing too, and the project I'll talk about with the meat industry, the reason why there's an attraction in with membranes is because um, they use some dissolved air flotation for a DAC. Uh, they to add chemicals to that DAC. It's also quite unpredictable. And so once you add those chemicals, you compromise the value of the materials that comes through that DAC. So this is where membranes actually are quite, uh, quite practical. You still need to clean them. That's done separately to the actual processing. The market is growing, um, projected to increase from $10 billion worldwide to two ten billion billion worldwide from uh, $6.4 billion today. And um, this is going to do pretty much the reasons that we're talking about, the things that this, uh, that this uh, in this in this hub is uh, it's, it's obviously for dealing with clean water and industrial applications and resource recovery. So where we are, I am, so um, maybe you haven't heard of Victoria University. Um, uh, it's uh, in uh, Melbourne, just uh, on, on, to, on the west of Melbourne. Um, and I work at the Institute of Sustainable Industries in Liverpool City. Um, it's directed by Professor Stephen Gray. So if you're in membranes, you'll be probably familiar with his name, or a water treatment. And now I'm focusing on um, Victoria University's industry collaborative research. And most of my all projects uh, have some industry connection or industry partner. Um, we look at membranes, we also look at across the range of passive membrane separations, different membrane materials, inorganic, uh, polymeric. We've look look, look, uh, looked at membrane isolation for quite a few years. We always look at other processes, we look at oxidation and disinfection uh, applications of how we use water recycling and dry management. Um, so, the first one I wanted to talk about um, was herbicide recovery from wastewater. So, this is an interesting project. Um, that uh, we were put in touch with a company called Clitech Chemical, and they manufacture MCPA, which is uh, which is uh, two two methyl uh, chloroacetic acid MCPA, um, and they were producing it, and uh, there was a waste from that. They weren't able to dispose of it, put it in the sewer, um, and, and so they wanted to see if they could recover that MCPA and uh, continue processing it, and obviously dispose of the water. This was removed as far as the wastewater. Um, there's actually no, and this is actually quite a, a typical situation that we will be faced with a challenge. We can talk about circular economy and resource recovery in the big picture, but when you get approached with a specific problem and you look for a paper as sort of guidance as to science um, that might guide which separate you should use, um, there is, a, in this particular case, there's nothing out there. There's information about the toxicity and so forth, but uh, there's no information about what you can do. So we go back and develop methods for analysis. We develop um, simulations for this particular case, reverse osmosis and nanofilter breaking, and even coined a new uh, process called temperature swing reverse osmosis. 
um, to look at how we can deal with um, separating at the, the MCPA and also do it in a way that um, utilizes its solubility relationship um, with the solution that we're working with and temperature. And um, we ended up finding that the, um, uh, these processes were successful, but the, the nano attraction was particularly successful. And so the, 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 the partner continued process uh, with the process and pilot plant, this is one of our pilot plants, um, and uh, then with that um, process. But we also found that um, you can enhance it through this TSRO process, um, but, and you can achieve your waste production for to meet uh, potentially meet the um, trade waste requirements of the, of the utility. The next one, as mentioned before, uh, um, with the red meat industry. So it's a project with AMPC, so I mean, Tofeber Corporation. So um, we took actually like a similar process to the way the dairy industry deals with its waste. Uh, they are, they, they're pretty much, if you walk into a modern dairy plant now, it'll just be membranes everywhere. So um, um, they use microfiltration to deal with um, fats. They use um, all the patient to recover proteins. And they also did use um, reverse osmosis to concentrate and find send off pretty much. The only thing left at a modern dairy plant is mineral. Take everything else out and sell it for something. So the, the meat industry wastewater, which doesn't smell nice and um, is quite thick, like a chocolate McDonald's milkshake. If you're planning to go to McDonald's this afternoon, then you may change your mind to get a bit more nice. It looks a bit like that. It's very high fat. These are grams per liter concentrations, not milligrams, and protein very high. And this time we used a metal membrane and the reason why this is quite a motivation and we went to the site where they we collected these samples um they spend a lot of money trade waste charges uh, to deal with the the cod effectively the carbon that goes into the sewer so there's a, there's a motivation here to take what effectively um currently a waste just redefine it as someone else's someone's trash as someone else's treasure right and so um we ran the micro this is a metal membrane there's a Australian company that makes metallic microfiltration. and this worked really, really well. And um, um and this is a this is a solution, this is the waste that would uh, has actually gone through centrifuge decanting already um, and can't be recovered with the current gravity processes any further. And so with the metal membrane, you actually concentrate it up further more. We simulate another centrifuge decanting stage. This is their existing equipment, put it back in, you get more tallow, and then we base the economic analysis on that. We found that um you can get some payback years, payback, simple paybacks of a couple of years. So I've taken out all the, the dollar numbers. They're all there. I can give them to you just to, just to put one slide. Um, but uh, you can pay off the equipment within a couple of years. And in terms of trade waste savings, so it's actually um, a big saving there. So if they can sell their tallow, um, that's recovered by this enhanced membrane process. So um, they actually save themselves mostly on the trade waste charges. And we also looked at um, uh, membrane installation and um, all the location again to recover proteins. But the big, big say that there was the tallow in terms of because of the tallow prices. Another one was uh, firefighting training waste for recycling. So this is um, uh, we approached by Arab, um, uh, an engineering firm, um, to look at um, uh, firefighting waste water, which is it's just heavily polluted and difficult to treat. Um, so this is from the training facility, so you know, not from normal fires. There's no water supply from, from putting out fires that you have to collect. It's from the training. So it's a reliable source of wastewater. Um, and so this is very tricky. As an example of it there, there's a, um, a tub of this uh, oily water. It smells like kerosene and all, of all sorts of things, including the bones that we used to put out. This is, a, uh, I guess, a plane that they're, 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 they're doing some training to put out. I put the fire out. So we had to develop a, a big process train. We simulated the whole all steps in that train, includes a ceramic membrane. Um, and um, yeah, there's more information in that paper, but it effectively worked. And um, the, the, the key unit operations um, uh, led to the, the well, um, guide of the design and construction of the plant, which um, uh, you can go on YouTube, there's a video for it, um, and it's saying, say, 30 minutes per year. So the process worked quite well. They didn't end up using a ceramic membrane. Um, they ended up using a polymer membrane. Um, but uh, yeah, so the separation is much the same. The next one is ammonia recovery. So we're still now on the topic of nitrogen. So, uh, you know, it's, it's um, uh, fixed to, to take it from the atmosphere, consumed once, well, leads to once in the world CO2 emissions, which is quite a lot of fun thing. Um, and this production of ammonia um, effectively feeds half the population, as far as I understand. It's a big number. Um, so we're actually relying on 
um, this uh, uh, carbon blocking process to produce uh, the ammonia extract from the air and then uh, produce that fertilizer. And then we pay money to treat it at a wastewater treatment plant, put it back in the air again. So this is the whole idea of uh, uh, closing the loop by capturing it while it's sort of fixed. So um, this is a project uh, that was supported by funds from intelligent water networks and on site in the Champion Central Highlands Water in Ballarat. And so they, they run a, a fairly conventional water treatment plant. This is the, uh, the sludge treatment process crane. And um, they already take the, the um, amber, after the anaerobic digesters, they press out the sludge. And um, there's a, a, an ammonia rich solution that they send to a lime dosing facility. That actually automatically raises the pH. So the pH is sort of about nine, so it's ready to be liberated. Then we put vacuum membrane distillation on that. And, um, and we tried it just directly from the line dosing and also the screw by process upstream. Um, and, oh, thank you. I'll better hurry up then. <laughs> okay. Just didn't want to okay, so um, so we had run the vacuum membrane installation and it's a pilot plant and it actually worked really, really well. Um, so, um, yeah, so we found out some practical challenges. Um, we'll talk to you more about that later. Now, I'll just talk about our project. So, um, um, this is uh, nutrient minerals, um, and uh, we're working with Parkway uh, Process Solutions and, um, and looking at uh, uh, well, uh, some work that we've done before together on the AMS, on the AMS process. Uh, it's called uh, AMS, which stands for Activated Mineral Extraction System. And effectively, it's a technology to treat uh, concentrated aqueous solutions and recovers a range of valuable minerals. So, you can take the site of fresh water, um, uh, you recover valuable minerals, and actually produces some. Uh, Minerals as high quality products. Um, and through the work we've done together and with, with what Parkway have done as well, in terms of checking out, uh, evaluating the feasibility on uh, potassium sulfate production. So we um, are working on a, apparently on a, another hub, so this is the energy efficient separation, which will come to an end this year, um, at least for, you know, for our project. And um, within that project, we, um, we enhance the AMS process. That's through high purity minerals and it's also energy and water efficient. Um, and with that, uh, we did some work in the lab, verifying some solution chemistry, uh, and this uh, allowed us to produce high purity sodium chloride, potassium chloride, leonite, which is a potassium magnesium sulfate, and of course potassium sulfate. Through these uh, tests in the lab, we built a pilot plant. Um, so basically, did all the engineering design and construction of this pilot plant. And uh, with that, produced um, a whole range of um, these products uh, that uh, you know, we had to assess purity and so forth to demonstrate the feasibility. With a, sorry, with the um, raw, raw salt feed, feedstock from, uh, from Salt Lakes in Australia, Kringle Lakes. So what we're going to do on the hub, um, so, uh, so our project is um, called an integrated water treatment process, the valuable nutrient recovery purification from industrial waste streams. And we, we're lined up with thoughts under um, theme three, but low optimization. Um, for four years, and uh, yeah, we've got our research team, Noel and Peter. That's myself. Uh, I already heard enough about me, and also um, our PI, Parkway Health Techman from Parkway Process Solutions. Um, and, um, and specifically, we're going to look at um, uh, more broadly uh, innovation, aeration, and membrane based technologies, including the MS process. We're going to further extend it with a with the nutrient um, recovery lens. Um, and, um, and we're gonna assess some industrial wastewaters for the potential um, and target some contaminants to be removed, produce fertilizers, including potassium and organic based. Um, and uh, I'll see take the studies from the, also on the lab and um, we, you know, depending how it goes, we'll um, be able to demonstrate that on our pilot equipment. Um, we're located, so this is uh, where Victoria, where my camp is, where I am in, in Melbourne, so it's the west of Melbourne, and Parkway Process is quite close, only 27 minutes drive, um, and um, yeah, we, we work together and share facilities. So thank you very much, and this is, uh, you know, uh, a, a fond memory of the, the hub that we got a photo together, and we should get a photo together in this hub too, so uh, yeah, so looking forward to working together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Yeah, yeah, you're okay. um, it's going to be uh, have one to two questions. Um, some ready questions from the audience. Yep. Anyone? Oh, yeah. Is somebody raising it? Yeah, yes, yeah, sorry. 
Thank you very much. Uh, and you notice you are mainly working on uh, some at this private scale size. Yep. Uh, and I noticed in a couple of cases you focused on the membrane distillation. I'm wondering um, for how long you can work it without waiting. Is it possible to run membrane distillation in any application, for example, on the recovery? Mm. Or even though for a couple of weeks without waiting or not possible. And second question, uh, I noticed you mentioned one place you use uh, ceramic membrane and another case uh, metallic membrane. Mm. And I'm wondering why is more not polymeric membrane? Is it uh, really economical or not? Thank you very much. Good questions. So for, you, for your first question um, on membrane installation, um, we've run uh, well three pilot trials. Um, the the first two, um, one was a, on a power station. Um, like we went for three months, no waiting. Um, the second trial was a textile factory in Wangaratta, um, and um, we ran it for um, well, about three months as well. With um, this one, had weekend shutdowns to time the battery. And we also clean the membrane with um, uh, we did cleaning trials of sodium hydroxide and sodium hypochlorite, no wetting. So, um, and the reason why is because in those papers, uh, there's a, a, well, a textile one in particular, because textile production, uh, you can have a wastewater that changes color and property basically by the hour, right? So it's, it's all over the place. So um, um, the, um, you have surfactants and you have all sorts of crazy things in there, right? So um, uh, we use foam fractionation. So it's on that something that Lee mentioned as well as foam fractionation to try and get the surfactants out and the surface active agents, which is what foam fractionation does really well. But we ended up um, uh, going with um, the, the most reliable way to prevent, avoid wetting was to, it, they already use a, a, an aerobic process to treat the wastewater, which is an oxidation basically. And at the end of that, um, the effluent is buffered because it's got a two days residence time. And uh, it's it's, it's uh, treated with um, a bottle process, and throughout the whole trial, we're feeding it with this water, no wetting ever. So um, yeah, that's just that was just a hydrophobic PTA in the brain. Yeah. yeah. So um, uh, yeah, you just have to make sure that you manage out the wetting risk, and it's fine. So three three months, no problem in both cases. Yeah. The power station one was different. It was a uh, ion exchange regen regeneration solution. So it's like sodium sulfate and tap water minerals. Um, no problem at all. There's some organics, but um, nothing, nothing better. And this metal and ceramic membrane. Um, metal membrane for the meat water because you can do um, uh, backwashes. So you can blast off the really oily, fatty material with this backwash or steam backwash, which you can't do on a ceramic or a polymeric membrane. So that's why that worked really well. And you can clean it twice a day, doesn't care. Polymer membrane might last less, it's cheaper, there's you know, these sort of things you've got to weigh up. But the ceramic membrane we use with the powdered activated carbon. So the ceramic membrane on the firefighting, we had a powdered activated carbon and we filtered the powdered activated carbon. The process that got built used the granular activated carbon and polymer membrane. So we use powdered activated carbon because it's abrasive, uh, sorry, sorry, membrane because it's abrasive resistance. But you can avoid that in other ways. Get it just polymer membrane. Just that. Yeah, that was it. But ceramic membranes have a report that shows they can be cheaper than polymer, only in the, in the specific circumstances. So yeah, depends on the situation. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Michael, Lee, for your presentation. Um, so later on, if we have more questions, we can have some time after all the presenters uh, for some discussion. All right, so let's go to the second uh, presenter this afternoon. Uh, we have Associate Professor Dana Cordell uh, from the Institute for Sustainable Future uh, from the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, Professor Cordell leads the Food Systems Research Group at UTS Institute for Sustainable Futures. She directs and undertakes collaborative international and Australian research projects on sustainable food and phosphorus futures. Uh, she is also co-leading the collaborative key features project across Australia, Vietnam, Malawi, and the US with 19 local stakeholders to investigate phosphorus vulnerabilities in urban food and water systems and local opportunities to transform those circular nutrient value chains and other initiatives. 
As a global phosphorus and food security expert, she provides expert advice and commentary to various organizations, uh, to the UN, Australia's chief scientists, and the UK Parliament. And she is frequently interviewed for various media, including ABC Radio, uh, National Wakeline, BBC, and Guardian. Please welcome uh, Professor Gordon. Thank you very much, Jody. Introduction and Sean and team for being here, part of the project. Um, the presentation I'm giving today, on behalf of myself and Professor Jason Pryor, who apologises can't be here, um, is about creating viable markets and effective governance for a thriving circular nutrient um, value chain. And it's probably a bit different to some of the other presentations because we're thinking about it from a, a societal perspective or even a national perspective. So more about what's stopping you know us from having you know in ten years or fifteen years these thriving nutrient circular economy. And I'm also struggling on that. I'm using arrows. What am I? No, I am I no, using arrows? Click, click the, like, once you click the arrow, then you can use the pointer. Oh, that one. So there, that arrow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just thought before we, we delve into it, it's actually really insightful to go back to the, the origins of the circular economy because it has really significant implications for us thinking about the, the nutrient circular economy here in Australia um, now. So, so, this, um, so we know that historically the concept comes from, um, you know, the concepts of industrial ecology and spaceship earth. So thinking much more about you know, waste and environmental concerns and preventing pollution and emissions and linear material flows. Um, and therefore driven and implemented by a lot of um, really fantastic process engineers and waste managers and environmental regulators. But what this means is that the focus has been predominantly on optimizing all of these um, fantastic innovative technologies for recovery and perhaps at best thinking about you know, reuse markets and um, engaging stakeholders more of an afterthought, and that's something we really need to, um, to improve across um, Australia and I think internationally. Because from a food security and a broader sustainability perspective, um, developing commercially competitive products like fertilizers at scale is going to be crucial. And I know many of us in this room understand this, but it's a really important message when we're engaging other stakeholders in this transformation. Um, and similarly, it's great that you know, so many people um, in this room and other scientists are increasingly aware of global phosphorus scarcity as a really important driver, but it's still not really understood outside um, a lot of these circles. Um, and we need to, um, to understand that while all farmers need access to phosphorus, just five countries control 85% of the world's remaining phosphate rock. And we know that Morocco holds the largest share, three quarters. So what this means is that whether we're talking about Australia or, or Europe or India, um, we're all dependent on um, imports, which most countries are indeed, and hence vulnerable to price fluctuations and supply disruptions, like we're seeing right now with a 400% um, price spike. So what this means is that investing in renewable fertilizers from local and sustainable sources in the circular economy um, addresses not just all those fantastic benefits around pollution reduction and avoiding waste to landfill and all the other um, associated costs and emissions, um, but reducing dependence on imported fertilisers. And what does that really mean in practice and at a strategic and, and policy level as well? Uh, because Australia is the world's fifth largest importer of phosphate fertilisers. Um, yet here in Sydney, for example, we have 15 times more phosphorus in our organic waste than we do from um, demand from local agriculture. So we can really sell, you know, Sydney conceptually as, you know, Australia's next renewable fertiliser factory um, so that we can secure fertiliser supplies for our farmers and buffer against these price spikes and export bans um, and, of course, reduce the mining of this non-renewable finite resource to support food security and increase local employment and local manufacture, which we know is a big priority in this country at the moment too. So this is our um, conceptual interpretation of the circular economy um, specifically for organic resources. Um, and we've drawn from the European Parliament's um, general circular economy diagram. We know there's a, a lot of, touch anything else. Um, there's a lot of focus more on the, the lower orange pieces around um, you know, the collection of organic waste, whether that's manure or food waste or wastewater. Um, and certainly 
lots of new innovative technologies for, um, for treatment and processing, there's a lot less work done on the purple and blue side. So that's about product development and, um, and the retailing of, um, of these products. And that's indeed where our projects are focusing, um, collaborating with um, Gary Leeson from OCP. Within the circular economy, we talk about um, you know, redesign and remanufacture. But what does that actually mean for organic resources? So we know that physically recovering those um, organic wastes and recycling the nutrients in them is certainly core to the nutrient circular economy. Um, to make it truly viable at scale means we need also to consider circular markets, circular flows of knowledge and integrated governance around that. So thinking about you know, who is my target, um, target end use market, is it a, a home gardener or is it something like a high-end um, tomato or indoor um, horticulturist and what therefore the implications and what do I need to know about um, my end user to better design my market, um, my product up front. Um, and similarly, other questions around um, circular governance, uh, like how can we integrate policies that both incentivize um, removal of nutrients to prevent pollution and at the same time um, productive recycling in, for example, agriculture. Um, and then those bigger questions about who actually is the guardian um, overseeing the whole um, circular economy and, and organic um, or nutrient value chains. And is it within government? What scales? How does um, national, state and, and local government interact? And which departments? Um, so what, is, what else is stopping nutrient reuse at scale? Uh, so we, again, we know these barriers are not all technical and they're often related to economics and markets and logistics and fragmented governance. Um, if we want nutrient use to be taken seriously at scale, um, we might need to design our products um, and market them better. Um, as many of you know, I like to call them renewable fertilizers because I think that's much more attractive than trying to sell the idea of um, sludge or digestate. Um, the fertilizer industry, for example, are operating in a commercial context and they need reliable supply chains for these raw materials at high volume. And certainly from our engagement with the fertiliser industry over the past decade across Australia, UK, Malawi and Sri Lanka, we're hearing this same message. So, for example, um, in Malawi, so I can't even read this tiny print, um, when we engage the, the fertiliser main fertiliser manufacturer there um, to understand what the barriers were to the use of human excreta, um, he was... His disinterest was more because he was constantly having NGOs and small, you know, waste contractors knocking at his door with, you know, a few bags of um, excreta or compost. And he said, don't talk to me about, you know, a few tonnes a day. Come back when you've got 100 tonnes a day and then we'll talk business. So it's an economy of scale issue for him. Um, similarly, when we were talking to farmers in Sydney about what's stopping them from using some of these um, organic waste materials, um, there was a lot of frustration. And, for example, one farmer saying that, Waste contractors are dumping compost um, at our farm gate and wondering why we aren't using it, um, but we don't have the machinery to spread it. So that's a really important um, insight. We need to talk to the farmers. And similarly in Sri Lanka, to understand their um, fertiliser sector's um, barriers to um, the use of human excreta, for them it wasn't so much the yuck factor, it was um, that, you know, it's just a marketing issue. So what this tells us is that um, instead of waste managers spending millions of dollars and a lot of time recovering nutrients and then searching for a market uh, more as an afterthought, we need to talk to farmers and other um, stakeholders in the circular economy value chain um, up front about their needs and their preferences. Um, otherwise, these might continue to fail. And again, I'm talking about how do we scale up um, this so the first of the two projects that um, we're leading at the Institute for Sustainable Futures is around um, some of these questions of circular markets to really try and overcome some of the barriers. And I mentioned this is where we're working directly with um, Gary at OCP. Um, and I, I mentioned um, you know, the original diagram of circular economy, those concepts of redesign and remanufacture. Um, what does that mean for um, organic um, resources like, like nutrients in terms of markets? So, what do we need to consider before we go out and design technology, ideally, to recover those nutrients from whether it's urine or wastewater or food waste, et cetera? Um, so I won't go through all of these. I'm not sure if you can see them anyway. These are just some of the questions we're starting to ask in this project. So I've already mentioned a um, really important one, who's my target end user? And um, Gary will talk a bit more about that from, a, from an industry perspective in his presentation next. Um, and then questions around um, which distribution channels um, will I be using to sell my product? 
So for example, is this something that will be an intermediate product um, that is sold to fertilizer companies, um, such as being, is being um, pushed in, in Europe at the moment, um, or is it an, a finished product that will go on you know, retail shelves? And again, Gary will touch on this a bit further. Um, and then what, what raw material feedstocks are actually available in and around um, our region? And is there a need to secure long-term contracts contracts with the essentially the owners of that organic waste? So um, with the councils, the food waste, water utilities, for the wastewater, uh, third-party um, third party private industry waste processes for say digestate from anaerobic digestion and so forth. Um, and then thinking about the geospatial um, location, are these organic wastes distributed across the city or the landscape? Uh, are they co-located? Um, what's the feasibility and logistics of storage and collection? Um, and we've talked a lot about, um, about urine diversion and reuse. Um, who's going to be developing the new um, collection systems for urine across the city? We've got a lot of fantastic examples of um, demonstrations for, for urine collection, but what would that look like and who's going to be in charge of that? Um, at scale, so we talked about those 5 million tonnes even in Sydney of Huron. Um, and then what's the value proposition? So starting to think about marketing and branding to your, to your end user, but not just your target market, market but also um, thinking about policy makers and industry at large. How are we going to sell this um, to them? Um, stop that one there. And there's a whole bunch of key features of renewable fertilisers, um, not dissimilar to, to current um, fertilisers, but with a few sustainability additions that are important, not to just farmers, but the fertiliser industry and national food security as well. Won't go through them all, but we need, uh, as I said before, a reliable supply at scale on the market. And these products have to be affordable and competitive. Um, it's a no-brainer that they have to be safe and non-toxic um, and quality control across um, all these um, toxins. Um, and ideally, they're environmentally produced. They're from renewable sources with low greenhouse gas emissions, um, et cetera. Our second project is about um, the governance for a thriving circular nutrient value chain. And so essentially, we're looking for what are the effective um, governance frameworks that we need um, interestingly, the OECD did a study looking at the major government obstacles um, to the circular economy, specifically in cities and regions, though not specifically about organic resources. Um, and they found, this is from a survey of, of um, councils in those countries, they found that the five major gaps related to um, funding, regulation, policy, awareness, and capacity. And you can see in this, um, in this graph that many of them were these um, these obstacles were either major or important obstacles to those, um, those stakeholders, uh, such as inadequate re regulatory frameworks um, uh, to, to support the transition to a circular economy, or lack of awareness of some of the stakeholders within the value chain, um, or incoherent regulation um, across the different levels of government. government. Um, and I'm sure you're all thinking, yes, we can relate to that here in Australia as well. Uh, so we want to tease out what some of those might mean as well for Australia through um, stakeholder engagement that we'll be doing and in focus groups um, as well. And some of these issues that we know about in um, New South Wales and Australia might be around the ambiguity of roles and responsibilities. So it's really not clear who is responsible for both managing and financing um, the exchange of those resources from the waste, um, from the waste source um, through to, to use. Uh, we know there's fragmentation of policy and regulations and guidelines as well, partly because these have historically been driven more by um, concerns of environmental um, and health risks, pollution and, and, and bio um, safety. Um, and, re and regulations have been somewhat um, ad hoc and piecemeal and responsive because um, how do we keep up with um, all of these amazing technical innovations that are happening? Um, so we do need a much more coherent um, um, and, and proactive framework. Uh, we also need to look at what we can learn from other regions, particularly Europe, so not just in terms of the European Green Deal, which came from the EU Circular Economy Action Plan, but things like the European, um, the EU Fertilising Products Regulation, which just came into effect um, a few months ago, and that is going to revolutionise um, fertiliser markets in Europe um, because it specifically allows for organic um, materials to be used as raw materials to produce fertilizers. 
And then you also have countries like Switzerland, the first country in the world to mandate uh, that phosphorus in wastewater and animal waste um, must be returned to agriculture. Um, and finally, we might think about um, what other policy instruments are available um, to us and um, do we perhaps need a nutrient trading scheme that puts a value on phosphorus and nitrogen, not just as pollutants, which is already happening in, in parts of the world and parts of Australia, um, but as a valuable resource to incentivise that productive reuse um, in agriculture uh, for food security. So I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Diana, for an interesting presentation. We have uh, time for one two questions. Anyone from the audience? Yeah. Thank you, Diana. It's very much uh, relevant to our project. Uh, we did follow up a lot from uh, your presentation. And just one question regarding the Switzerland. They have to return all the passport from wastewater. Yeah. No, it's like how we can expect only passports or like a wastewater a lot of uh, different uh, minerals or fertilizers. So why they only select this kind of phosphorus and then how they are planning to implement this kind of problem? Yeah, that's that's a good question. So I think it's uh, they're in the transition phase and this must be operational by um, 2026, I think, which actually is not that far off, is it? It's a few years away. Um, it's not all of the phosphorus. I think it's... It might be 50%, I can't remember the, the details, but that's a good question about um, whether it also specifies co-recovery of other minerals and resources. Because um, they used to reuse a lot of like, sludge and biosolids, but then they, they banned that. The same with Germany, I think Germany also has a very similar um, mandate that's just come out. Um, I'm not sure that they specify the actual technologies that have to be used or whether it's just um, the quality criteria the end point, but um, yeah, we should we should dig into it further. My colleagues will know the answer. Right, thank you. Yeah, just one more. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Dan. I can really relate to that. And working on working on the the safety aspects, quite able to safety. And I think it'd be really good to work together because we have to manage not only actual waste management risks but perceived risks mm. of all the stakeholders. So um, I'd like to encapsulate all of those in the modeling of the numbers of the Okay, um, maybe we can um, have that one at the end. So we can uh, speak on the time for the next uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so our next presenter is from uh, one of our industry partners. Uh, basically, he's working uh, closely with uh, Professor Cordell, with Anna. Um, he's Mr. Gary Lisa. He's the Innovation and Business Development Manager from Organic Crop Protectors. Um, Gary comes from a third generation farming background and is certainly trained in sport science. Uh, in 1993, Gary joined Organic Crop Protectors and over 25 years built the company into a leader. The organic farm and garden inputs. In 2018, Gary sold OCP to EA Australia, where he continues to innovate and develop very products. So today he's going to talk about the E in consumer which present. Um, please welcome uh, Gary. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yeah, so my, my presentation today is, or I guess, you know, as I mentioned in the, in the morning session, is it's really around the consumption side of things. Not, I guess um, I'd also like to sort of explain a little bit about OCP history and how we got involved in this project. But um, the deep dive is really, I guess, looking at um, perception potentially with um, and segmentation of, um, of consumer groups. And that's really sort of what I wanted to focus on in this presentation is how companies like Yates, for example, 
segment the market and, and target a particular type of consumer. And I think that's really what we need to need to achieve in this in this project. Um, working with Diner and, and the team is that perception part, and also what is, who is our really our target market. So, so yeah, that's that's basically what we want to cover off. But anyway, just to give you a little bit of background as to, to OSDP, we're part of the Dulux Group. So Dulux Group is a very complicated business. It's about um, a $4 billion uh, business. It's part of Nippon Group now. Nippon uh, Paints and Decorative Coatings is number two in the world and number three in the world. Um, they're around about a $10 billion uh, company. But, uh, but within the Nippon, Dulux sits now. And um, Dulux Group is made up of many brands and many SDUs. So we have the Dulux, obviously, the Dulux trade and retail paint business, the Selly, there's the parking business, which is um, more to do with. Um, Concrete additives, etc., which is an interesting conversation about like carbonates, etc., in concrete, which is something certainly Dulux Group is involved in. Um, and obviously the Yates business, which which OCP, which I sold my business to to Dulux Group through Yates four years ago. Um, that's made up of many brands as well. <clears throat> they also have a um a bit the VND Prolinol business, um, and um, Lincoln Century, which is all to do with hinges and various architectural um, uh, type of um, knobs and frames, et cetera, et cetera. And then they have a fairly large footprint in the national market as well. So a very complex business, very large business. So little OCP, we're now part of this global conglomerate. In terms of, I guess, the Yates business, um, it's made up of the garden care business, which all of you guys are familiar with. It's a 139-year-old um, brand that started off in New Zealand all those years ago. Um, the commercial side of business which I see in is, is, um, is OSDP, they acquired us and we, we look after so all the larger pack sizes that go to farmers and poly houses and amenity horticulture, which includes you know production nurseries and turf operators, etc. So that's that's where we sit. Um, then they have the home pest business, which is uh, the rat sack uh, rodent business and flying and crawling uh, products, and pine grow, which is a fairly large um, waste recovery type of business, composting. Um, et cetera, et cetera, in, in um, Victoria and New South Wales. In terms of our, our capability in manufacturing, you know, if we're talking uh, millions of litres of euro, we need somewhere to um, to actually process it and bottle it. Um, in terms of our solids uh, con conversion business, um, we, we have the, a very large footprint up at YE in the central coast of New South Wales, which is the old dynamic lift plant, which produces or processes about 25,000 tonnes of um, of chicken manure on an annual basis. Um, and we have the ability to pack off materials from the two and a half kilo satchel of stand up packs for fertilizer right through to a thousand ton bulk of bags in that facility. Um, as I mentioned, the pine grow business, it's um, um, currently they've just got approval, or well, just recently got approval for EPA in Victoria for processing um, BOGO and uh, biosolids and, and other food, food waste. So the pine grow business is quite, quite a significant um, waste. Um, Conversion facility now that um, we're working through, and in terms of the liquid um, Mount Druitt is our is our main site for producing all of our liquid uh, products, which we feed. You're probably familiar with, and uh, all of the OCP range of fertilizers, etc. That we make that has the capability of about 100,000 uh, liters per week of, um, of processing, and that that business that manufacturing facility really sits within our uh, our major DC uh, um, distribution. Uh, center, which is around a 10,000 square meter distribution center. We have all of the distribution centers in Victoria that we own in Victoria, Melbourne, and Brisbane, uh, Tassie, New Zealand, and, and WA. So a very large capability um, to, to manufacture and um, distribute products. In terms of the, the distribution um, at the retail level, uh, Yates is, um, is, is involved with all the major retailers, in particular Bunnings. Um, we're probably we are the largest supplier of money across across all products. So I guess in the hardware side of things, but we work very closely with Woolworths and Coles and um, and all the other independents and all the small nursery retailers as well. And we have a significant online business just of our own, but also uh, with um, with the online presence of our retailers. So so we cover all markets um, in that grocery hardware area and online presence as well. So we're we're pretty much covered through um, all of that. Um, consumer type, type um, distribution of, of products. In terms of the garden care market, um, these numbers are a bit old, but it's probably pushing up around the 400 million now in terms of just 
fertilizers and potting mixes to some degree, but certainly um, soil conditioners and the like you know, in that lawn and plant health uh, category. It's yeah, it's around about a four hundred million dollar business in Australia now. So it's um, it's not not insignificant. It's a, it's definitely a market that needs to be considered when when looking at opportunities for these sorts of products. In terms of where I sit and what, what we do, um, the Australian cropping fertilizer market, as mentioned by John um, earlier, it's a, it's a 5.4 million tonne market, and that's just the elemental uh, NPK. It's not the actual you know, the fertilizers uh, in their compound form. So it's a, it's a substantial amount of nutrients. But it's mainly sold to broad, broad acre farmers, yeah? So they're very difficult to get to. They're, they're, you know, they're in remote areas, a lot of these broad acre farmers. And you need you need the distribution infrastructure because they deal in bulk. Like it's it's big bulk business. It's not putting in fertilizer bags or in little 100 mil satchels or 100 mil containers. It's it's they're talking you know semi trailer lives. They're talking big large um the ammonia type um, ammonia that they use in cotton, for example. They they, they come in 25,000 liter um, um ISO tankers. So you know you got to be you got to be set up for that sort of business. But in horticulture, it's a bit different, like because it's such a fragmented industry and um, and such a diverse industry. Um, you know, it's made that market be around about two hundred thousand tonnes of compound fertilised. Um, veggies take up the majority of that share, um, followed by fruit, fruit nuts, and um, wine grapes, and 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 about ten thousand. We estimate about ten thousand tonnes of fertilised goes into that amenity space, like professional turf market uh, production nurseries. And the like. So, and within the, that food production area, the organic market, which around the is about two percent of food production, if you extrapolate, it's around about four thousand tons. So, not a not a, not, not a large market, but certainly a, a focused market for a product that uh, like like recycled nutrients, if you can get it certified organic, um, which is um, something that needs to be determined as well. Uh, we work with a whole range of resellers. Um, there's about up to a thousand um, different um, rural. We're all merchant stores that we we sell our products through, so we don't deal directly with the farmers. We we work with all the agronomists who um, sit in those businesses, and then they talk to the farmers on our behalf about our products. So I guess now to sort of uh, deep dive a bit more into the consumer side of things, like if, if we're able to get a, a I guess a, a fertilizer that, had, that that has the value and the and the NPK and the safety and everything else, we'd sell. All that fertilizer into the AKM market, you wouldn't need to worry about looking at potentially a consumer market. But I guess I wanted to just give you a bit of insights in terms of how Yates sort of approaches researching a product and its potential use in let's say that consumer market of 400 million. Um, we we um, had a project put together at 55 as a consulting company uh, last year to um, to look into how we segment the market. Uh, we've had, we, we probably do this every four years, I guess. Yeah, this is our, our latest um, addition to you know looking at consumers from values, perceptions, behaviours, etc. So what we um, what we found <coughs> was that um, we split split the market up into what we call enthusiasts, so home gardeners that are really engaged. Um, they're the ones we sort of we like to market to because they're 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 sort of already captured market. They like gardening. And they enjoy sort of you know that that joy of getting in the garden and, and growing something and and sharing that joy with others. But then there's also the novices and 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 the disengaged, which are really the ones that are difficult to market to. Um, so we tend to concentrate on the enthusiasts, and you got the what we call the the internalizers and the externalizers, and then you've got the um, in this case the conscious uh, connectors and the joyful nurturers are the, are the internalizers. So they. I think about things, um, uh, the extri the intrinsic, the extrinsic value of it, like the, the you know the emotional part of it, whereas uh, the thermalizer, like the creative um, um, expressiveness, and and our, and our friends right over the left there, um, they they tend to sort of be um, in, intrinsic. It's more about sort of showiness, and um, you know I'm doing this garden because I want other people to sort of think about how wonderful my garden is. It's like the lawn. Lawns these days, a lot of young people are getting into lawns, like the young families that are spending thousands of dollars on aerating and renovating their lawns and making them the greenest in the street. You know, it's, it's sort of like I'm going to outdo you in terms of my, you know, how great I'm growing a growing lawn. So they're they're on that that other end of the externalizers. So 
But in terms of our, um, yeah, so I'll cover all that. Um, in terms of perception mapping, um, we also looked at you know, where, where they sit in terms of the, the natural organic environment and friendly versus professional grade chemical, uh, chemically effective. And then the garden envious and the novices are up there in that chemical effectiveness kind of um, kind of area. Um, whereas the conscious uh, connectors and our joyful um, joyful um, folks there, and they're in that um, that love, that environmentally friendly um, nurturing type of environment. But then there is, if you cross reference it against value, um, you see that there's there's a premium market and then there's the affordable market. So you've got to look at how you position your product in terms of price. Well, with these people within a market where you think they're they're environmentally conscious and they're usually captured, they need to you need to look at the value in terms of the price and all that sort of thing. So, um, so overall, with the enthusiasts, um, the external and internalizing uh, environmental consciousness comes into it quite a bit, and even with the um, um, the expressionists, they also um, appreciate. Um, the environmental aspect of it, but mainly it's, it's around that feeling and sense of sustainability and, and the like where you've got those um, conscious connectors and, and joyful um, nurturers. So a deep dive a little bit more on these on, the, on these people, they grow, um, it's about a 10% of the market, so it's about 40 million, um, and they have large, large gardens, and they have a range of different sizes of lawns. Um, and they spend a lot of time in the garden, 19.4 hours uh, per week. So this is sort of data we start to sort of build on these on these on these customers. Um, in terms of proportion, who are currently using plant fertilizers, 68 percent of of um, the conscious connectors use plant fertilizers. Lawn, and then 30 percent use lawn fertilizers and plant fertilizers and lawn fertilizers. Right? Um, and that's that's the main pain point is um, the effectiveness. Um, in terms of the channel, it's uh, it's Bunnings Warehouse. Um, so you have got to look at okay, well, if I want to sell to these people, I've got to get Bunnings on board. That's and to get Bunnings on board as a buyer, you've got to think about that side of the, the equation as well. Like, what does Bunnings think about selling your own to to their customers? So the same here with um, the creative expressionists. They they represent. Um, uh, seventy percent of the market. Um, thank you. 28, 20, um, 20 hours a day in the, a month in the in the um, in the garden. They have also large gardens with a small lawn, um, and that's one of the pain points. I'll just push through. Lawn fertilizers are up to thirty five percent will use lawn fertilizer, and sixty nine percent use the plant uh, fertilizer for their gardens. Um, once again, bunnies. Is the main distribution point, and these the um, joyful nurturers, uh, large size garden once again, uh, they represent eight percent of the of the market, which is a bit smaller than the other two, obviously, um, and they spend a reasonable amount of time in the garden as well. They use a lot of plant fertilizer, uh, lawn fertilizer as well, and um, they are concerned about the environment. So joy, joyful nurturers and very concerned. So. And once again, Bunnings is their main point of um, of re re picking up a retail pack. So that gives you a bit of, I guess, an understanding of sort of how you start to profile the consumer. Um, so what we what you look at doing there is you've got those three different types of consumers, potential target market, and then you start doing your work around. Okay, um, I need to deep dive a bit more on how they might use a urine-based fertilizer. But it's interesting, right? That represents about thirty-five percent of the overall garden market, which is similar to the number to what was um, discovered in the global studies around acceptability of um, urine um, uh, as, as as the product we use in the garden, which was around forty percent. So numbers add up, which is interesting. Um, but then, I guess, looking at in terms of that consumer, what's the low hanging fruit? If you want to target those those three segments. Do you go for like creating a, a fertilizer that's used on plants for food, or do you go for something easier perception wise for a lawn perhaps? So a quick sort of look at then you start sort of digging into lawn, the lawn category, and like this that, that's when you start to sort of look for all the different traits associated with you know what makes up a lawn consumer and lawn fertilizer. 
Um, and we get to you know, understand the barriers, which is um, 50, 47% are just happy not to not to fertilize. 53% are, but 47% are gone. Like they don't, they're not interested in using a lot of fertilizer. So we're trying to focus on those 53% that are. And things like um, is it is it is it going to be effective? Is it is it easy to use? I don't know the time, so you need to produce something, a product and a packaging that's going to be easy to use. So so then we move, you know, through through to um, that's the timings as well are important. So when are these customers going to be using the product? So most most consumers in lawn will use in autumn and in spring, and the rest of the year there's not too much activity. So you've got to understand, you know, supply of your fertilizer. When when do I make it? You know, coming in the spring, I need to produce a lot, um, and coming in autumn, I need to produce a lot. But for, for lawn fertilizer, anyway. Um, and all the functional needs, you know, they're important, easy access. That keeps coming through with lawn. It's value for money and easy to use. Environmental um, friendly also comes in a little bit, but um, it's really about that easy to use. So, so you really got to think about, okay, well, what sort of product can I sort of develop for lawns for these three consumer groups who like to, you know, use sustainable type products, et cetera, um, that sort of going to do the numbers for me in terms of volume. Uh, we we sell um, wheat and feed to the, to the consumer market, 2.9 million litres um, a year of wheat and feed. Yeah, it's terrible, I know. M2PA by Canberra. It's, it's watered down, but it's still a lot of herbicide. But the Conscious Connect is, um, he, he doesn't mind whether he uses a, a, wheat, a wheat and feed type product. So we probably look at him as being a wheat and feed customer. We're using the NPK, like the urine as the base feed, part of the wheat and feed. Um, this is sort of price you could potentially come up with, which is uh, weird. <laughs> but you know, you've got here sort of where you know you need to you need to the packaging needs to match the requirements of the customer. So a hose on is what works because it's it's it you know it's low, low so you're not touching it um, and it's easy to use. Map onto the lock, the hose and off you go. Um, but then with the joyful nurturers and the, and the um, expressionists, they they tend to worry a little bit about the, more about the environmental side of things. So you know you come up with a plant tonic with seaweed plus MPK from natural source being urine, and then you got your pea salt. Um, so they're the sort of things you start to to work out as um, with these consumers, like what what fits the market, what packaging fits the market, and those things need to be considered. So. So what our plan is to really deep dive a bit more and do more focus groups on those three consumer groups and, and look at you know what where is the opportunities in lawn is it in is it in food production in the garden um, but at least we've got a target market to start looking at instead of the shotgun approach of you know just trying to get it out to everyone and so yeah it takes a lot of takes a lot of time and effort to see man, but it's very important that uh, so that's achieved so so yeah thank you I thought you know a few insights for you uh, thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Gary. Um, any questions? Just one probably for now. Yeah, so no, it's super interesting for your talk. Uh, just a, a question in two parts. The first part is, did we actually sell our products to this market of uh, uh, private uh, garden growers? Um, so what happens after they, they grow their garden? If it's uh, lawn and flowers, can the nutrients be kept going around circularly? Or what happens to the grass if it gets cut usually or the flowers? So have we lost them or is there a way that we can actually yeah, yeah, good question. It, it, yeah, you do. Obviously, um, you know, if they are composting at home and then the lawn clippings at home, then that obviously gets reused in the garden. But if it's going into the green bin, um, then that will go to a recycling area and be turned into a compost and sold back to Yates or whoever wants to buy that compost. So it does, it does, I guess, you lose some of that nutrient when you start to compost because you're getting and ammonia and whatever being formed in the compost seed. But yeah, that's that's sort of where that circularity comes in. I guess in addition, though, if you were to change, you know, FOGO is becoming increasingly uptake. And there's dry AD, for instance, which then produce digestive nutrients by pulse. Yeah. yeah. And with our YE plant, for example, we're looking at biogas and utilizing FOGO. Um, 
and the leach from that, extracting the ammonia out of that, and turning that into a fertilizer, and so all this interesting things going on. So, yeah. All right, thank you very much, Gary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we're going now to the second to the last speaker. Um, we have Professor Bernadette McKay. She is the uh, she's a professor for the Center for Agricultural Engineering at the University of Southern Queensland. Uh, she's the director uh, of this center. Uh, she has a background in agricultural biotechnology and has over 25 years experience as an academic and researcher. Her research investigates technologies that enable intensive Australian farming and food processing industries to turn their commercial waste into a valuable commodity. She works with this industry to be more profitable by using organic waste to produce biogas, clean recycled water, and biofertilizer. And her research has been applied to the livestock and cropping sectors, uh, both on and off farm and water utilities. And currently, she is one of the Australian Research Council and College of Experts. Please help me welcome uh, Professor McKay. Thank for the kind introduction and um, to Sean Safana and um, all the team um, for this um, great launch. And it's really nice to see everybody face to face. It's been a pretty long journey to actually getting here. It's the first time I've been really at UGS for, for a long time. Um, so it's really my pleasure to be presenting today. Um, just to give a bit of background around the Centre for Agriculture Engineering, we are based in the University of Southern Queensland at the Toowoomba campus on the Darling Downs. And uh, being a regional university, um, we uh, really get the, um, have a, our back door, uh, backyard is really the agricultural community. And within the centre, we have been working with um, the agricultural industries for nearly 30 years um, around four key areas. Um, irrigation water management has been probably the, the impetus behind the um, research centre, but we also do a lot of work around farming systems innovation and um, automation, robotics, machine vision, and the program of work which um, I initiated back in 2010, looking at around energy and bioresource recycling. So we've worked a lot with um, uh, intensive livestock um, sector like pigeries, dairies, feedlots, but also abattoirs and the rest of the industry. And so our particular area um, of participation in the um, ARC Nice Hub is around the optimization of the biofertilizers. And the program of work, which um, we've a new program of work, which we've also included, is around biosolids derived um, biofertilizers. So I guess this where we come in, we're both looking we're looking after both number one and two <laughs> for for this as well. So just to introduce um, the project team, uh, it's myself as at, CI, at but also um, we have a collaboration with Dr. Dia Anchel. Who was a former um, researcher at the Centre for Engineering, who is now with CSIRO Food and Agriculture based in Canberra, uh, Dr. Serge Majuk, and Elini um, Silva, who um, is currently an RA, but we would hope to recruit her as a PhD student connected to the project next year. So, my presentation was, is really just about um, the intended work that we do. We have commenced some work around um, work package two, particularly, but just to to talk about the methodology and what we'd like to um, get out in terms of um, the, the outcomes to match the objectives. So in work package or WP1, um, we will be looking at the evaluation and demonstration of UGOLD and overall efficacy and field trials. Um, and that of course will be involving um, urban utilities, uh, the Department of Environment and Science of Queensland. Um, and we, we are basically part of the Brisbane Norwich um, we'll be working with um, Parklands. And so all the background has been presented by other um, presenters earlier. So we'll be just looking at the methodology. In the second work package, uh, we're working closely with um, uh, Logan uh, City Council and also Pyrocal as the, the technology provider. Uh, we're looking at the bio, uh, Logan Home Biosolids Gasification Project. And uh, this is um, received uh, half funding from ARENA um, to do a trial. And Pyrocal has a, the core, I guess it's a gasification carbonisation technology, which is 
turning the biothalids into um, biochar. And um, the prime uh, piece of work that we're looking at there is to, I guess it's twofold. We want to, they want to understand first of all that the biochar material as it causes no harm. So we'll be looking at um, contaminants in that um, biochar material and also the agronomic potential of those um, biochar material. So the project objectives, um, if we look at first of all, the um, disevaluation demonstration view goals of Minerval, um, we will be first of all looking at the specifications for novel urine derived biofertilizer products. Firstly, that meet the requirements of field application and therefore its physical properties, but then also the nutritional needs of the plants, so the chemical composition as well. Um, I think Diana, you mentioned about you're looking at the market um, and the end use. And so what we would be um, looking at, particularly with the solids fertilizer, is to put it in a form that is granulated so that it is able to be spread by conventional farm machinery. And that's part of what we've done um, as well in previous work. Um, once we get a, a product which has got those um, spec specifications, both chemical and physical, we look to evaluate the proposed formulations and product format to determine the fertilizer replacement value um, of your own derived biofertilizer products. And also to look at some gui um, guidelines. With the second work package uh, concerning Logan Holmes Biosolids Gasification Project, as I mentioned before, we want to determine the effect that the conversion technology um, has on the heavy metals uh, content and also the mobility of the byproduct. So during the, the thermal processing, we understand that heavy metals are, are formed in a matrix of sorts, but we want to understand, you know, what is the actual mobilization. So we've already started conducting leaching experiments around what how it moves through the, the soil column. And we'll be looking at particularly zinc, primary <laughs> nickel and, and lead in this regard. Um, and but also the nu um, nutrient leaching as well. And so looking at um, is the movement of um, the NPK through it out. And then, of course, to assess the agronomic potential by looking, first of all, how available are as NPK, and then also the potential for you know, plant yield by determining agronomic response, both in the glass house and also the trials. <laughs> so some generic um, methodology will be placed over um, both work package one, looking at the urine derived um, biofertilizers and also Work package two with the biosolids derived biochar um, to compare the organic fertilizer with the inorganic, um, looking at chemical and physical specs and some place <coughs> formulations both at the field and greenhouse biosolid studies. So some of the background work as I said we've done his leaching experiments as well as these um, as you can see in that far uh, left hand um, image we. Have done some work around the mobility of um, these heavy metals and um, this is just some previous work we've done around um, some biosolids actually that was from a, a former project um, that we did looking at the yield to nutrient and response relationships for materials and we would compare that with the sand and mineral fertilizers such as urea. Uh, the type of crop we use there is ryegrass. Ryegrass is a quick growing crop and um, it's, it's good because we can then therefore take multiple cuts um, throughout you know, six, 12 month um, test and be able to understand what the biomass yield is and also understand what the uptake of heavy metals is um, as well. And so you can see that's uh, looking at looking at the, the dry yield, as I said, the dry grass grows very quickly. Um, you can be recording it for every month in order to establish relationships in terms of the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that we can buy. This is actually an air plot just out in front of um, where we are at, um, in Toowoomba. Um, this is just some so, um, wheat that we applied for a former project that we'd be doing something similar. But of course, as um, stated previously from um, other presentations earlier in the day, the way that we would be looking at the um, liquid biofertilizer and urine derived would be looking hopefully particularly at the port sector and applying it in the parklands. But in order to understand that too, we'll be doing some in-house trials. Um, you know, as 
Now, you mentioned that uh, it's very different from broadacre cropping versus the court. Um, and previously, we've always been um, looking at, um, at applying it to the you know, crops like wheat, which is this one. So we, um, we'll be interested to see how we can apply the methodology across there. Um, so we'll be looking at a, a long-term, we'll try in three years in this, uh, this four-year project. We'll move in sense of soil resilience and also heavy metal buildup, both in the soil and also recovering the grain or the biomass. So just a few dot points around, of course, our industry benefits um, and outcomes. We want to be able to prove that the product will be able to be um, actually have a, a value to it so that there will be, an, in the end, an income stream to the you know, users um, and also the licensing of the technology uh, to enable reduced um, or at least you know, reliance on the costs associated to both the disposal of products, or, or sorry, waste, but also increase agricultural recycling. Um, of course, it's reduced the uh, farmer's reliance on mineral fertilisers, which are likely to go up price, actually is to be revised because they are currently going up in price a lot at the moment. Um, and we'd also want to be able to set some sort of monetary value in relation to the sale of the product. So that's it. Uh, as I said, it's basically an introduction to the work that we will be conducting and some of which we have commenced. Um, and yeah, I just look forward to, to starting to really carry out and sink our teeth into the next four years. Um, and just an acknowledgement to um, the team members who work particularly around the biofertilizer side, that's us standing in the wheat field at the front of the building. Um, and um, that, that's it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Adam, for the presentation. Uh, we still have a bit of time for some QA. Uh, is there any question or comments for the presentation? Yes. The, the, um, the, the study at um, Brisbane uh, Council, that's, that's a nutrient study, is it? Or how is so it's Logan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, similar in that I uh, said that it's uh, the role is really um, purpose is dual. Um, first one, of course, is to understand that the product causes no harm, as I said, so it's more from a regulatory point of view. And so we'll be looking at, um, you know, in that form, PFAS, of course, is, is thermally removed, you know, through the thermal process, but then there's also about the heavy metals. Um, the other one is about, you know, what is the agronomic um, potential of biochar, we understand that all, not, you know, all, you know, not every, not all carbons are labile. And so it's like, what do we are getting from there? But also from the nutrient in terms of P. So your phosphorus is very much reduced compared to biosolids. So we'd be understanding nutrients particularly. Golf courses are not being considered. Golf, Golf right? courses, because the cattle exchange like biochar is a, the cattle exchanger, yeah. So sand-based greens, it would would have great potential. Exactly, yeah. So we're looking at various soils. We're uh, looking at sandy soils, dirt soils, all, all sorts of things. So, but you're right. That's a, a good end use um, to be looking at that. Yeah. Anyone else? All right, thank you very much, Brenda, for your presentation. So we have come now to the last presenter, uh, certainly not the least one. So we have um, Dr. Liu Lie Li. Uh, she is an associate professor uh, from the University of Queensland in the School of Chemical Engineering. Her research focuses on focuses on sustainable environmental engineering and is dedicated to quite innovative and practical solutions to tackle challenges in achieving net zero uh, emissions, climate resilience, and sustainability. She is the Greenhouse Gas Research Program Leader at UQ, um, Organ Water Engineering, and work collaboratively with industry partners. She has an established national and international leadership in the research field of net zero emissions from organ waste products systems. Please tell me about uh, Professor. All right, finally, we are coming to the last 
it's me. So I would definitely um, try to um, give a very uh, well wrap up things. And um, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Liu Yan from UQ. So in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions research program, we're uh, we're looking at uh, basically including um, the wastewater production, uh, sewer systems, the uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, also, um, sludge stabilization, also new technology development. So today, um, I give uh, I'm considering the background um, of the audience, or so just to, uh, more talk about the general about um, net zero carbon footprint, uh, how um, we may manage that when we take in the urine out. Um, so in this uh, nitrogen circular economy. Okay. So um, carbon footprint, um, I think a lot of people may think this is about carbon dioxide, um, but for wastewater treatment, um, actually that's not a concern for wastewater industry um, because the carbon footprint we look at, we really look at the total CO2 equivalent. So um, if we are using a global warming potential to look at carbon equivalent, um, so if you can, yeah, so, um, so CO2, if we say this is one, and we have another two um, potent greenhouse gas, one is uh, methane, and one is nitrogen. So, global warming potential of methane, um, these are the um, biggest uh, guidelines. So, it is changing uh, different years, but now currently we're taking 28 tons of CO2, and the nitrous oxide is 265. So, that means when we um, calculate the CO2 equivalent, uh, with one ton or one kg of N2O, we multiply by 265, convert it into CO2 equivalent. And for methane, we multiply by 28. So you can see that um, these two, uh, if you emit a small amount, that's going to contribute to a big or large part of total carbon footprint. And in terms of the scopes, uh, wastewater treatment uh, plant or all the industry, basically when they're reporting, they need to look at different scopes. So the first one is called a direct emission, uh, which is the uh, direct generation of producing of the greenhouse gas. And then the um, second and third are called indirect emissions, basically associated with energy uh, or electricity uses or other products. So for um, Australian um, industry, uh, things do require to report scope one and scope two emissions. So scope one emission is the uh, melee sage uh, methane and two O, and also CO two which are coming from fossil driven, which is not the biogenic CO two uh, during the respiration of the nitrogen in the wall. That's a small portion. And scope two emission is basically the uh, power consumption. If some of the aeration or electricity cost is coming generated from the fossil uh, fuels, and that's uh, contributed to the indirect emission. So these one and two are, are mandatory to report. And then uh, scope three is also an indirect emission, basically um, outside of direct um, sort of uh, utilities, but related uh, to other uh, sort of, um, for example, if it does chemicals, the generation of these chemicals from another industry, maybe uh, become your source really. Or for example, if we produce fertilizers, the fertilizer the chemical or biosolids produced from the plant, then we would, when it was used for another industry, uh, then that is uh, the emission generated there are associated or regarded as source. Currently, source rate is not uh, mandatory to report by water utilities. Um, so in terms of the net zero emission, how what utility uh, try to achieve this target. Um, basically, so this um, this graph so really shows a uh, uh, case study reported by uh, UK. So um, this um, blue color, um, which is re uh, representing scope two emission, that's the past um, between 2000 and 2010. So the more and more renewable energy was used, you can see that scope two emission reduced. And then um, this this uh, uh, this yellow one, and also this. The other one is scope one, and the red one is scope three. Uh, that remains to be the big portion. And then these are remain unchanged. Um, this is because they are using sort of a fixed factor. Um, so they didn't, uh, didn't actually really monitor, they just uh, calculated um, these emissions. Um, so this, um, this uh, below graph basically shows uh, when more and more uh, renewable energy will be 
and we use by water utility agents if they are going to be dominant by scope one emissions. Um, so for urban wastewater um, treatment, the direct greenhouse gas emissions typically uh, when we look at Enflo and Methan. So for Enflo, it is mainly from here into the second treatment. Talk about about urine separation. So that's where the ammonia is need to be uh, converted or removed. That's happened here. So that's where the nitrogen oxide will be generated. And then for um, uh, for Methan, it is going to be generated uh, through the treatment lines, uh, sorry, through the collection system and then emitted there. Also, uh, during this large treatment, uh, if we have anaerobic digestion, it will be made, methane generated as bowel gas we collect, but some will be leakage. And also, um, if the further on solids will be um, stored for long term storage, methane will be generated there. So, um, among uh, with the methane and tool generation, nitrous oxide normally, because it's huge global potential, it's contributing to the majority. Of the carbon footprint of chicken plant. So um, today I'll focus about Antwo because we're talking about when we we're taking urine out and how that may affect uh, the total carbon footprint and total generation. So in terms of the um, uh, when we calculate, so currently there are uh, three tiers uh, when we calculate the emissions. So the tier one, the first tier is basically the IPCC international guidelines. We call it top top down guideline. So this is basically based on country specific or overall emission factors, and then you apply the emission factor based on the nitrogen loading coming to your uh, plant, and then you can calculate the emission. And the tier two is basically national uh, country specific. It's not international. So for each of the country, if you do not have your national based uh, guidelines, you can use the international one. But uh, for Australia one, well, we do have our national. Uh, accounting guidelines. Um, so basically, this is the, the second year. So currently, we're still using a fixed factor. I will introduce that later. And then the um, tier three is basically um, also called bottom up. That is for asset specific. Um, basically, um, you can do the um, for each of the plants that you are operating. You can do a quantification and measure the emissions. Different locations get your own emissions accurately quantified. Okay, so um, so this is the linear, uh, so the Australian uh, national guidelines for entrance in this example. Um, so we do update our mission uh, guidelines a few years. So how it was calculated, you can see that nitrous oxide. Uh, basically, this is two parts. The first part is nitrogen removal. How good do you uh, remove your nitrogen in the plant? Multiply by a, an EF secondary, so your um, emission factor, get the first part. Second part is really um, the discharge. This effluent, how much nitrogen left in the effluent, is another emission factor. Depend on where you discharge your wastewater. If you discharge in the deep ocean, basically, uh, that is your government regard. Do you do not generate any but uh, uh, you must get if discharging into river or lake, there is emission factor is located there, but that's the minor part. Major part is here. So in Nika guidelines, so this uh, the first talk is 2017. You can see that we use an emission factor, which is defined as nitrogen emitted at the to all the total nitrogen removed. So if that's about 1.8, sorry, 0.1.85, what's that? 0.0185, 1.85. And then um, uh, in 2000, this 2011, to 2011, this emission factor reduces. So, uh, that means if you're just using the national guideline to report your greenhouse gas emissions, carbon footprint, uh, even if you don't change anything, uh, that your, your total carbon footprint will be reduced dramatically because uh, the government changed their emission factor. And the wastewater treatment plant knows that's not the truth. So for them, how to quantify or how to actually manage their footprint, they actually want to do monitor. So they want to do uh, quantification to see how much is actually generated. Okay, so um, before I talk about how we're going to monitor that, I just want to say until generation is really dominated by uh, the nitrogen removal, this uh, more complex process, you do not have to understand the details. Uh, I want to show you because I want to show you um, there are uh, dominantly three um, uh, biological pathways and then uh, two from the um, nitrification process, one from the denitrification process, and also about uh, a chemical process. So the reason I want to show you is because 
This nitrogen process is affected by many, by many factors, operational factors. For example, aeration. If you um, if you give not enough aeration, bacteria may not have it generate. Well, sometimes you give too much aeration, uh, they don't have the volume to that to 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 go to, to, to remove. They will also be not happy because cell lysis, they will also generate. So that's really uh, it's very specific in terms of operation uh, we applied uh, to the treatment plot. Okay, um, so the impact, well, we, when we're talking about, um, we try to take urine from the treatment plot. I think that's a question was asked by Gary. When, when, uh, when, when Lee, um, Lee Gao was talking about you know, taking urine out. So um, this is really a case. When urine is taken out, how will that make that the current uh, nitrous oxide generation in the treatment plot? Um, so, um, for example, I think the first thing when urine is taken out, we know okay, there are less nitrogen comes into the plant, right? So, you may say, ah, oh, generally less than 2 -0. Yes, this may be the case, but if you um, apply the same operation condition that you provide the same amount of oxygen as mentioned, you may over aerate and over aerate the plant, then not, not necessarily that you will reduce the two. So, the operation conditions may be affected. Um, um, second, um, uh, there may also uh, affect your scope too. For example, uh, yes, there will be uh, less nitrogen. So that means you don't need a lot of aeration. You may reduce your aeration. So that's um, a reduction of your, of your energy usage. So scope two will be reduced. Okay, so scope two, scope two, uh, scope one, scope two may be um, uh, affected. And also in the meantime, um, the COD, because your nitrogen was taken out, and some of the carbon removed, not only carbon can be removed uh, by nitrate, right? So this anoxically. But if you're taking your nitrogen out, then there are more COD, you know, wastewater that to have to be removed aerobically. If you do not change any, any of your process, that means more COD actually be wasted. That's also something we need to consider. Then you may say, okay, I probably can look at um, how I change my process. For example, when urine was taken out, we probably can consider to capture more carbon at the beginning of the primary study. So there is a is one capture one technology called high rate aeration. So that you actually try to apply very short aeration period, you absorb more carbon carbon bacteria, and then you send them to the digestive. So that means you actually do not have to remove COD, but capture the carbon, send it for methane generation. So that means that means in the later you probably will get more energy recovered and that will offset it. So um, all this will have a potential um, effect by the, um, by the urine the separation effect to the operation of the trigger plant. Um, uh, lastly, um, also there are opportunities when urine was taken out, that means your plant will have more capacity to trade uh, nitrogen. So I know um, a lot of uh, utilities now try to do cold digestion. That means they transport the food waste or other um, sort of waste to the digester, and then they try to generate more uh, biogas from that. But um, another issue is when you uh, sometimes when you get more uh, biogas from it, you also uh, get a lot of ammonia left over from the digester. So that that may be an opportunity that some of this uh, ammonia generated from cold dishes can be the capture by currently treatment plant. Uh, I think these are all sort of um, the opportunities and challenges that when we take the urine out, how that may affect uh, um, the existing treatment plant and how that may uh, help with the design of the future uh, treatment plant. So um, what I'm going to do is that um, partner with Icon Water and uh, Normal Water. Uh, so we're going to do a the first monitoring um, as a baseline to look at their carbon footprint from their current operation. And also um, with a mathematical model built upon the case study, we're going to evaluate the urine was taken out and um, how that may affect the carbon footprint from the treatment. And also any other opportunities that we can apply uh, to improve um, the carbon uh, reduced uh, efficiency and uh, improve the efficiency. Um, also, I think uh, with the urine part, I think if urine was also um, oxidized to um, to generate nitrate. There may be some um, opportunities that we look at how that nitrous oxide may be generated from this process as well. So if you do um, get um, the already um, studies set up, then we're happy to um, provide monitoring um, set up to help you to quantify the greenhouse gas aspect.
Uh, in the end, I guess for um, wastewater um, treatment um, uh, or utilities, uh, really is how we can remove um, nitrogen or um, recover nitrogen using the least energy. And then to help um, also the um, the treatment plant to achieve the lowest emission. Um, I think that's all for my presentation. So uh, thanks for uh, my guys, my partner from the University of Melbourne Water, James Lloyd and Peter Woodrow, and also Joel Wood uh, from Ico Water. Thanks. That's all for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Johnny, for your presentation. Uh, we have a few minutes of questions. Yes, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Uh, very important work. Uh, very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I just have a question. Um, just with West, Western Treatment Plant is one of your case studies, wasn't it? Yeah, so that's the new treatment plant. Oh, the new plant. Okay, I'm not familiar, but I was thinking of the classic. So, because, you know, the, the, it's like a mainstream a um, anaerobic process, yes. which very unusual, but yeah. you're not, I can see, but you're not looking at that. Yeah. This, this is a new treatment plant they built for um, set feed. Oh, so, okay, so not the, the original one. Okay, yeah, yeah okay. So, in, in its sense, it's more of a more of a more impactful kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, oh, thank you. Yeah. Very Interesting if you have the mainstream um, um, anaerobic digestion, maybe that would change the dynamics a bit. But it's that mean, yes, yes. Now, the water actually also looking at another uh, new technology. So, yeah. basically, uh, they try to use um, anaerobic MDR at yeah. the beginning. Uh, to get methane generated from the wastewater. Later on with the um, enriched uh, um, stream or with ammonia, I think they try to use zeolite to absorb the ammonia to mm -hmm. rather than sit down and actually get it purification, but to absorb this ammonia using zeolite. Yeah, yeah, capture. Yeah. Gary. Oh, Gary. Gary. <laughs> Gary. Interesting side of that um, you mentioned the um, the, using deep ocean um, discharge for nitrous oxide and it's removed completely. Can you, can you give us a bit more of an insight in terms of depth in the ocean as a stratification on this? Because, you know, with climate change, our seas are getting this great activation and you know, movement of nutrients in, in, in oceans. You know, can we still rely on that as a zero emissions? Well, from my point of view, I think that's uh, that's sort of more like government sort of the, or um, the political. So say when you're discharging to, into ocean, then there is a zero emission. But in fact, we know it's uh, where no matter where we discharge, and then there may have uh, risks that you have um, because nitrogen cycle is everywhere. Even in the ocean, we have the whole nitrogen cycle goes. So I think there are people um, uh, in Australia like studied in greenhouse gas emission from oceans. They did see that if you discharge into the ocean, definitely there are nitrous oxide emissions, uh, emissions generated from that. Um, in terms of the deep ocean, I know some of the treatment plant, they do actually um, probably discharge that um, a few kilometers away from the, from the shore. And then uh, even those who is not uh, properly treated. So, uh, but in my opinion, um, so so you know, well in Australia, Lingus is using this two part. But for um, other like IPCC, they just use a measure factor, which is a proportion proportional to your nitrogen loading. So it's, it's well, it's also an issue. But basically, didn't look at the two part. And uh, Australia do uh, look at the two parts. But uh, my opinion is. Um, as well, as if we have the engineering system, the better that we treat our wastewater and then the lower emissions that we may be generated down, downstream so when we discharge our wastewater. And also as an engineering system, there are very good opportunities that we can optimize we should reduce these emissions. So they give us a good opportunity using the engineering system to reduce the emissions rather than just uh, get them emitted. Well, I guess plants, city water, all that leachate, which is very concentrated in the ammonia, is pumped out. <laughs> yes, but uh, again, currently we don't have those systems. <laughs> so we, we don't have any sort of monitoring, like quantification guidelines. So there is no regulation talk about, okay, um, how often you should, you should monitor and where you should monitor and how to tackle. So there's currently only two guidelines, which I will show you. 
that's it. So um, I think they are driven, as an honest reason to be driven by um, what utility, like um, some of these uh, water is also um, partner. So they try to study, quantify these, um, these emissions from their plant. You can see that in different units, there are potentials for different greenhouse gas emissions. So um, definitely, hopefully that can be seen by the higher level and then later on, we'll have more uh, strict regulation there. All right, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thanks. So those are our speakers for this afternoon. We're going to open uh, for a few minutes for a further discussion or further questions. Uh, I think Vivian wants to have a question regarding we data before. Yeah, I have a question. I think this question might go to Donna or you know, I just um you know, one when I look at the circular economy, one item there is uh, efficiency. And you know, like let's say I just put it in a very simple words that is what I understand is that. You know, we're going to utilize urine as a fertilizer, it's going to grow, and then you grow the crops. But the part of this crop you will eat, right? You want the roots and, you know, like all those items. And I just wonder, there might be a target. We say, oh, if you have like a 50% recovery, that's our aim. Is it 100% recovery, 5%? I just wonder, out of this, how much is actually our target? So let me just and Larry Boy needs to be more of the interested. Thank you. I, I can make a broad response if you want, and then others probably make a more specific. I think in, in general, the, the yeah. efficiency versus recovery, um, usually efficiency invested in, in tightening up the system and reducing losses is the lowest hanging fruit. That's usually the lowest cost option, whether you're talking about water nutrients, whatever. Um, and we know throughout the whole food system, globally, we're losing 80% of phosphorus that we're using. So it's a very, very inefficient system. So we do want to make that more efficient first in general. I think you're, you're probably talking specifically for urine as a source, which we're talking about urine. Um, and, then, and then I think we, yeah, need to look at um, what makes sense. Um, I don't think we'll ever have 100% recovery from, from any source that makes sense. Cost effect in this perspective, and you know, so many trade offs, so it might be energy trade off in the end or whatnot. But um, if you look at it from a food security perspective, even just looking at phosphorus, let alone nitrogen, um, we will need to be in the future recovering almost all sources of um, the phosphorus from almost all organic sources back into the food system, and then having some. Um, new new sources, whether that's algae based, from phosphate, rock, or external sources. But um, we're going to need to do that in the future somehow. We're going to need to get very good at doing that. But first, we do need to improve efficiency. And I was just telling someone during the lunch break a really nice example of a business model that's based on um, more thinking about efficiency. There's a there's a fertilizer retailer in the Sydney Basin who um, <clears throat> basically instead of selling farmers um, bags of fertilizer, particularly phosphorus, he says to them first, wait, before I sell you any products, you know, let me test your soil. I guarantee you, my mind is in time, it's in your basin, it's supposed to be perceptual of phosphorus. And sure enough, they are. So he rather than sells them an agronomic service to improving productivity on their farm. And so it's a great um, win-win because obviously for the farmer, it's a good outcome in terms of the productivity of the farm. Produces nutrient loss um, into the waterways, produces mining prospects. Um, that's a great business model for this company that has a nice competitive edge. So, that's an example of how you can um, implement efficiency in a business model sense as well. So, then that's you know, basically something to us. We do need to do a lot better with that. Um, in terms of some of the technical or cost aspects of um, recovery, what's the optimal amount of need to recover from your own? Maybe others have comments on that. Oh. 
I was, uh, you know, I understand it won't be 100% recovery, but I just wonder is this 5% or 50%? Uh, I, I understand it won't be 100%, but to recover it through the urine, I guess, this seems many people talk about it. I'm just curious is it like 50 or less? Or so I just add something else, correct me if I'm wrong. But so if you put so 100 tons of nitrogen, you you grow food, so you will probably have lost half of that because of agricultural practices. So you're down to 50. So that 50 uh, is gonna go into the plant. Not all the plant is eaten, some part of the plant is uh, wasted, hopefully used for resource recovery to other roots, then you might be down to 40. Uh, then there's food processing, and then we then food waste, maybe we're down to 20. And then uh, urine actually accounts for 80 percent of the nitrogen in our excreta. So, so maybe we are close to 10, 10 to 20. That's uh, what we can do at the moment because of the constraint of the whole system. So, with some additional points, and Mary, you add to it too around farming practices and the importance of actually leaving some amount of biomass and nutrients and trash or whatever to remove the till so that we then reduce, you know, your, your um, or improve soil often minimize on action. It's a really important part anyway that we don't recover everything because it's actually the use of the farms. Yeah, I guess I can add to it a little bit too, I suppose. I guess it also depends, yeah, as, as mentioned, the, the, the cropping type. If it's, if it's a vegetable, um, you know, if you say go for lettuce, the majority of that, that material is going to be harvested. But I hate lettuce because it's such a waste of water. Um, but yeah, I guess if you wanted to really look at how how to value the, the nutrient and use it more effectively, you just look at a crop that's really high phosphorus, uses a lot of phosphorus, not a lot of nitrogen in its production. But potatoes, for example, use a lot of, a lot of phosphorus. Um, so yeah, it's sort of, I guess, looking at, looking at the sort of crop you want to target in terms of um, gestation period, like how those nutrients are utilized by the plant, how quickly um, to produce that waste of bleaching away the fertilization as well. It also depends on place Poly fertilizer, so you know, a lot of, of variety of crop is now, yeah, that's all like no tool, direct, direct seeding, the direct, direct in the fertilizer into the root zone. So there's a globalization issue, it's, it's reduced potential. Um, you might tend to get you know, um, bleaching, but um, you know, depending on the type of plant and how quickly it grows versus the you know, irrigation, yeah, so there's a few it's, you can kind of still, but. Yeah, it's all about, I guess, yeah, just selecting the type of um, high value crop that utilizes those nutrients quickly. We're not going to be collateralized at the cost of your agricultural practices yet. Yes. And just one other thing to add, and you know, this all over organic fertilizers is that the addition of carbon is going to change your plant soil. And microbial interaction so that your nitrogen use efficiency is actually going to improve to actually preserve or using less nitrogen and using anyway because of the inclusion of carbon. Yeah, so I guess one of the things that we to stop the discussion, but uh, we are quite limited in time. So thank you very much for all the speakers this afternoon and all the speakers uh, for, for the whole session. Thank you very much. Um, all right, so before I, I call on the staff, I know for the closing remarks, and then we have also, um, um, how would say, networking drinks here. So the drinks will come in later on, so we have one hour to do that. Uh, I don't want to take that much of time. I just want to present the survey that we have set up last week uh, for some of our stakeholders in the hub. I just want to go and run through this one. So we would like to really close the feedback loop later on. So we'll look at feedback and then try to improve as we go on as we are still launching the, the, uh, the hobbies today. All right, so for the participation, we sent out this um, invitation to 40 plus colleagues that we had about 30% came back. So it's the, the response rate about 30%, so 40 of them came back. And um, we have uh, coming from the CIs, 
uh, the PIs as well, and, and most of them are from um, the CIs and then some other um, organizations like international collaborators. Um, we have more from the academic staff, we have from industry as well as from government agency, and, and the others are, are more of the advisory board. Um, look, um, for you have about 10 to 12 questions. So this one is um, we're looking at how we are faring so far in terms of the, the nice hub in terms of management. So we, we asked that one how we are doing so far. So more than half, luckily, more than half 12 labor of pay for now. Um, so it's about four and five uh, uh, questions, but uh, some are quite disappointed, but we're trying to improve anyway as we go along. Um, do you believe the nice hub engages well with investigators? So majority said yes out of the 14. Um, there are some comments with regards to foreign communications. So of course, yeah, there are a lot of challenges. So in the background, there's so many challenges before, but of course, communication is one of the things that we, we need to further improve and also to make more clear or clearer about um, the cross being integrated among products. So I think along the way, we're going to, to do this and uh, make it clear as well. Uh, what are some of the issues that you're experiencing in relation to your product? Of course, we are still starting this is just the third month. So some of the, there are still no issues with right now, still too early. Um, we have mentioned about HDR recruitments. Um, some of the answers here we, is actually related to other questions. So we, we just summarize this one and we will talk, take it up in the other uh, questions. Um, about a clear strategy for any integration among various products. I think that's one of the key um, answers here as well. And a need for a regular engagement and communication between stakeholders. So I'm not too sure exactly if it's between the hub and the stakeholder of the hub, or it's between the stakeholders between each project. So I think both cases should be uh, a better regular engagement as well. So what help do you need from the hub to ensure success of your projects? So yes, it's again the integration and connection of this you know, project internally has to be very clear, and there has to be a strategy for this and to clarify how the all of the projects are working together. So as we can see that from our presentations today, there are really potential collaborations between each other. So I think we need to integrate those things and make it clearer uh, between the academic as well as industry. Uh, transparent timely updates and progress of, across all sub-projects. So eventually, we will have this project update. So we will have some scheduling for this one. Uh, specialization of engagement with stakeholders, um, some are you know, wants to have some admin work, probably I'm not sure I need to have funding for that, but yeah, admin work regarding rate requirement and regular progress meetings. Um, what should we be the priority focus of the hub? So yes, so it's actually clear from the presentation today that there needs to have uh, the building of the community acceptance, uh, the demonstration of economic and environmental benefits uh, of this neutral removal and reuse, especially from urine to the fertilizer, uh, there's a lot of answers on collaborating and has to be established between each other's project and more focus and support for the researchers uh, to do quality transfer and research. Yeah, there's a the message of education in the hub, but I guess both could go together. So we need also to expose our hub as much as possible uh, to the, uh, the larger audience. What do you believe are the main challenges the AFC Nice will face in the future? Um, Yes, again, it comes back again on the integration of the different projects. Uh, this is a key, um, key term here. Um, then keeping the partners engaged. This is very important for us that we need to make sure that industry partners and academic needs to be engaged as much as possible. Otherwise, everybody will lose interest. So we have to keep engaged in that one and keep supporting and maintaining the commitment of the participants. And then we have pilot testing on work commercialization in the future, definitely. Uh, that would be uh, within this project or even beyond that one. So we need to have some funding for that as well as commercialization and potential partner for, uh, for commercialization as well. And of course, this one is very important for us to really, you know, uh, have this potential technology and acceptance of this is very important. So regulatory changes and public adoption at the end. So eventually this will be our final goal as well and commercialization. Um, what do you believe the NICE Hub should do better for the coming years? Yes, it's pretty much, I mean, very similar um, answer to your strategy and engagement. Um, external strategy between stakeholders in the hub, as well as um, the clear collaboration and integration of projects. And then uh, consulting with world experts, probably internationally as well. 
And of course, this one is basically, uh, yeah, it's a given that we need to complete our sample time and develop a power delicious plan in the coming years. Um, do you have any suggestions of activities that we can do in the hub? Um, aside from this summit, the uh, most preferred ones on regular webinars. Probably we could also think about that on regular webinars and followed by workshops and networking events. So it's a good thing we have a face to face method now. I think it's really good for our discussion. And also, potentially, we could have some um, annual summit or even a circular economy conference. So these are the least ones um, in the order of uh, preference. How often do you think the CSNP should meet? Um, yes, it's either bi monthly or quarterly. So the regular progress reports is important, as I think this is the, the main message for this one. All right, so any suggestions to improve the management and communication with the hub? Um, uh, there's some uh, comments on the website. Um, definitely, the website needs improvement. We're still working on developing the website, so there will be further information there. And we also need your um, cooperation in giving us your biography and everything like that, so we can provide information. But definitely, there's an improvement there. Uh, this is uh, about also giving information at the high level, so drivers and outcomes of the whole hub, and also make it more welcoming. Probably that is redesigning something there. And make the search engine ranking better, so it's easier to searching uh, uh, along the way as we as we uh, try to disseminate our hub. Social media, it says that LinkedIn is a very good platform. We also have Twitter, uh, newsletter. Yes, uh, this is a suggestion here to have newsletter. In fact, we have a newsletter now. Definitely, we will be continuing a regular newsletter for everybody to be um, to know the progress of the hub. Uh, presentations on hub project uh, monthly or quarterly. Uh, Rosberg for different projects in order to be engaged as well as to be updated. And this one's also good. Um, um, a suggestion of having a Google Scholar page basically as an ARC 9000. So any, any publication that has any ARC 9000 there will have a Google Scholar page. I think that could be a possible way to go forward uh, for this donation. All right. So, yes. So, we, we thank everyone for your um, feedback. Uh, there will be there are a lot of things that um, you know. It looks like everybody, everybody uh, most are happy, but we have more improvement to go as we're still early. It's the three months uh, in. Uh, we still have at least almost four years to go. So definitely, thank you for your feedback. And as we go along, we'll keep on learning. Um, okay. We keep on learning and growing together, and we need everyone's help to do that. And for your cooperation and, and for your, you know, um, everyone's help to, to, go, to move forward and to be successful in our project and we have. So, thank you. Any, any comments or anything? Do you have any comments for your comments? Yes. I think all those ideas for communicating, they were like communicating outputs and progress, but none of those um, suggestions would deal with a way of sharing information on a, like what's a communication app that we can um, post our ideas, post questions to somebody else from within the hub answer. Right. So that it's sort of like an interactive, whether it's a team side or a something, I think. Things. What would you suggest? Teams would be. Uh, okay. Thank you. Any other further comments? Maybe. Do you want to say something? Um, yes, sir. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for that. Um, now I'm going to call Dr. Um, Stefano for the closing remarks. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you. Thank you, Leonard. Uh, it's uh, been a bit of a long day. I'm not used to face-to-face -face conferences anymore. So yeah, I think we are getting tired and getting ready for a drink. So initially I had a couple of slides and then I just said, nah, that's just quite enough, let's just talk. But still I have three reflections that uh, I would like to share uh, at the end of the day today. And uh, so one is on uh, nutrients, one is on circular and one is on Sean. So let's start <laughs> with, uh, of course the name of this hub is nutrient in circular economy, so there's got to be something about nutrients, and that's what we talked about uh, a lot today. But a couple of uh, the questions that were thrown around made me reflect. So we understand that uh, there's a huge 
market, one million tons of nitrogen, one million dollar economy. But we also reflected on the fact that uh, even if we could take the whole urine of the whole population of Australia out today, we might be able to target 10% of that. So if we're doing very well and in 10, 15 years time, we can get uh, one tenth of that, we're still at about 1%. So it's really important to think about what Gary said, what is the market that we're going to go for? So we can go for the commercial outcome and maybe just target uh, in a low hanging fruit, just those excited home gardeners. But is that market gonna grow? Maybe we can saturate it, but that's gonna be it. So if we want to fuel the real circular economy, we need to also look at the market that is going to grow. So we need to look beyond that. So I don't have the answers, but I encourage you to think about what uh, markets we want to target. Uh, within the four years, we'll have some technologies that might be ready for commercialization, but we really need to have worked out uh, how we go from there. We might be able to uh, target a small market, but if we want the 10% unit separation to grow to 20, 30, 50 in the future decades, well, we need to be able to grow this. So how do we do that? Second reflection is on circular. Well, we talked a lot about what circular means, and we had a couple of uh, very interesting talks about it. And I think this is the essence of the hub, and this is what uh, makes this hub unique, that we're not just going to do technology and uh, um, agronomy, soil science, epidemiology, social science, we're gonna try and bring it all together into a circular concept. For the circular economy to work, I think we need to also work circularly inside the hub. That means uh, collaborate a little bit more. So I think that uh, uh, when we meet again one year time for the next hub conference or summit, well, we're going to definitely talk more technical because there's going to be a lot of data to be shared, but uh, I'll hope for a lot of these uh, outcomes to be collaborative outcomes that are not uh, generated in silo mode. So I would like to encourage everyone to, uh, to extend your boundaries to other players in the hub and, uh, and try to generate papers that are multidisciplinary in nature rather than uh, just driven by yourself in your own field. So looking at the circular picture that was shared earlier, uh, I think we're quite well covered. We have uh, uh, two or three, four large water utilities. Uh, and I think that there's a lot of benefits for water utilities uh, in what we're doing. So we're well covered there. Uh, we have uh, end users and, and related researchers looking at uh, the effect of our fertilizers on soil and how different plants are going to grow. And uh, we have certainly a lot of technologists, specialists in membranes, specialists in uh, wastewater technology. So we've got all that. I think that uh, where we're still a little bit weak is we need to perhaps work a little bit more with regulators. So bringing back some of what uh, Dana was saying. And I think that in Queensland, we, we took a head start by discovering that we're actually not allowed to do what we're proposing. And so uh, we're actually writing a letter to the minister there to start with an exemption. And then hopefully to from there lead to a new regulation because we're dealing with some regulations with our, which are not necessarily uh, ready for what we're trying to do. Uh, and along with regulations, with the regulators, maybe also a little bit uh, more emphasis on the construction industry. We, if we are to grow this, we need to incorporate our model into the building of the future. And this is what we may perhaps struggle a bit in getting on, on board into the hub. So the hub is a dynamic thing. So if you have an opportunity, bring a construction uh, company into the hub. Uh, and, and, and we can certainly uh, deliver something to their benefits uh, because they are part of this uh, circular pitch. So this is the two technical reflections that uh, I wanted to share with you.
And, and the last, I just wanted to reflect uh, about where we are at, bringing back some of the words that Sean said this morning. Uh, three years, uh, that's quite a long time uh, from the time we first had the idea until we're actually here to launch it. So this is uh, it's really wonderful to be able to be here and, uh, and to be able to start this. This was really a major amount of work. So not all of you were there from the start. Some of you have joined later and some of you in the room might have been involved from the start. So, so those who were here from the start know that this was not a walk in the park and we encountered so many challenges and we put in so much time, so much work and more than once we were told to say, that's it, this is over, this is not gonna happen. But thanks to the perseverance, particularly of Sean and his optimism and positive attitude throughout, I think we made it through. So thank you, Sean, for pushing us all during this uh, tough three years to, to get uh, this ready to go. So help me to thank our director, Sean. So to finish off, yeah, uh, as I say, try not to work in silos. So nothing stops you from emailing people that you've met today. I think a few people have got ideas for something they can do together. One year's time, when we share our papers, it would be good to see that a lot of the work is collaborative in nature. So don't be shy and just talk to each other, starting from the drinks now. And that's all. Uh, I'm going to have back to the airport soon. So if I didn't have a chance to talk to you, hopefully I'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have some network and our drinks there at the outside for you now as a break for this project. Okay. Yes. That's true. All right.